Hi everyone, welcome back to week 26 of my Know By Year. We're halfway through and in today's little chat we're going to follow up with yesterday's discussion on consumerism and content creation. Today we're going to talk about influencing as a job. So at this halfway point in my no buy year, and again in response to the video of everything I was influenced to buy, I've been starting to have a think about how this system works and whether influencing is a valid and or ethical job. And I'm talking specifically of like product focused or lifestyle influencing here. So not really providing people with an informational service or educational content, mainly just entertainment, lifestyle, and kind of general shopping. You could even call it consumerism content. Consumerism focused content? You know what I mean, I hope. Regarding product focused creators, you know, review channels, haul channels, shopping channels, people can argue that value is created by these people going out and buying these things, comparing them, reviewing them, so that the viewer can make a decision on whether they want to buy the product too. So they kind of do the work of providing the information and spending their money instead of us spending our money. Now the problem here is a lot of times they actually don't spend their own money. They're sent PR or paid sponsorships for featuring the content that they feature. And regardless of whether or not they acquire the products for free, their job is to make money from the content they feature, the products that they feature in their content. So their motivations for acquiring that product are always gonna be slightly different than the motivations of a pure consumer. So while their content may inform a regular consumer, the acquisition process is slightly tainted or skewed or different. I kind of talked about this in the PR video and earlier this week, I believe, about how when the acquisition process is different, the response is different as well. If I didn't go out and buy this because I needed it, because the need came up organically in my life, then my opinions of the product are going to be different. If I didn't buy this and comparison shop every other competing brand or really evaluate the quality of the item versus the money I paid in a first-hand way, as in I was parting with the money and I had to think about the options not being paid for any of the options <laughs> to, you know, to promote any of the options, my response is going to be different. My relationship with that item is going to be different. And so they might be providing a service by showing close-ups on camera or giving us insider views of the products that we wouldn't see in a, well, we would see them in a store, right? If we went to a physical store, we could touch the item, try it on, hold it up but they save us the inconvenience of going to the store perhaps. And then when we're online purchasing, they provide you know, an arguably important resource for us to get that view of the product before buying. However, I do wanna make the argument that many of these products in general are either A, manufactured needs that nobody actually really needs, or that fulfill a very small kind of niche market for people that might have difficulties, disabilities, products that fulfill individual purposes like making it easier to open jars or reach high cabinets, things that not everybody needs, but that can be presented as things that are nice to have for everybody even if they're not necessary, or they're B, paid for. So like the featuring of them in a video is a paid service from somebody above, like a, a client or a boss that is giving them a sponsorship opportunity, or even gifted free PR that the creator did not acquire through the natural means of a need presenting itself and them shopping to fulfill the need. And therefore, if this thing is not fulfilling a legitimate need in their life, the product is not doing them the same service that it might do somebody who found it organically because they needed it. I know I kind of just said that, but I'm trying to kind of say the same thing in different ways to contextualize it a little bit better. This also applies to things like the brand trips. I already mentioned the Bora Bora trip that the brand Tarte took a bunch of influencers on. Their experience of that trip, getting to go for free and use that as a content creating opportunity. I saw the trip because the creators shared their vlogs, their TikToks, their videos, their experience of the free trip, activities that were planned by the brand, the friends, friends, other influencers they got to spend time with there, the parties that were thrown by the, the brand again and the dinners and all of that. So the brand splashed out for all of this and it was all shared over social media. Their experience of that trip is vastly different than my experience would be if I went, you know, by myself with my husband, with my family, and I had to save all the money for all the activities that we were going to do, and also plan all the activities that we were going to do. And not to say that one is better than the other, 
but the experience is different and the priorities are different. And I think that's a very clear example, right? If you're getting a paid trip, you're not going to care so much about certain things. Whereas if you're paying for every little detail that's costing money on the trip, these details will matter a lot more. Then also the concept of value for money. If you didn't pay for the product or if you're being paid to feature the product, how can your value for money judgment represent that of a normal consumer? It just doesn't add up. Even if they try their darndest and have a system of vetting these things, the actual experience is not the same. And so at the point where the influencer makes that kind of content to make their living, I think is the point we reach this disconnect of like, their experience is no longer representative and relatable to the normal consumer, who is a non-influencer. One could also compare influencers to salespeople, right? Because influencing is a form of sales. Salespeople can also earn an uncapped amount of revenue if they work on commission. You know, the more they sell, the more they make. Same for influencers, the more products they sell with affiliate links, sponsorships, brand deals, they can earn possibly untapped, uncapped revenue. And one can even argue that social media and online resources in general have been a service and a help to the sales industry as a whole. And there are some benefits for the consuming side as well, because you are able to comparison shop and find brands and products that more closely align with your values. So if you really want to know that your goods are being made sustainably with fair labor, etc., it's easier to find this information instead of just walking into a big box store and buying something off the shelf, really not knowing anything about where it came from or who produced it. So that's positive as well. But unlike salespeople who work for a primary company, influencers do not have any form of brand loyalty. They might have a personal brand loyalty. I could use myself as an example. I'm not an influencer, but I have a whole shelf collection here of one brand of purse. So I, you could say I have brand loyalty to this purse company. And you know this even before I'm influenced. I've never received any sponsorships or PR from this brand. This is just a brand that I've bought a lot of their products organically because I like them. There's only so many brands that I would put in that category in my life. You know, there's this purse brand, there's a couple of clothing brands, and a couple of other products that I really enjoy using. But this is not something that constantly gets updated in my life. Like that's the very nature of brand loyalty. I'm not buying 10 different purse brands because I have my one brand. I'm not out here looking for more brands of clothing because I have my favorite brands and I'm good to go. Same for kitchen goods, same for, a lot of these things don't need replacing as often as people tend to do these days. So influencers do not have the same kind of brand loyalty as a salesperson who is working for a company and working exclusively with those products or products related to that company. Influencers are free markets, free marketers, right? They can take on any brand, any sponsorship. And although they tend to succeed better or not annoy their viewers, if they make sure to align the products with their niche, so like in a way their brand should be reflected in the brand of the products and the values of the products, it's not as exclusive as if their income was provided by that one source and they had that level of loyalty to their brands. I think the discussion of brand loyalty maybe merits its own video because again, I can explain using my own examples. You know, I have my favorite purse brand. Because of this, I don't really buy other purse brands. I might have in the past, but I don't look at them anymore. I have my favorite clothing brand. I have my kitchen stuff and things that I need already. Everything is branded and I could even say, oh, I prefer to drink Coca-Cola instead of Pepsi or whatever. That's my Coke brand, not drugs. That's my soda brand. Let's just be clear here. I actually don't drink sodas at all. So sodas are not on brand for me. And therefore, if I was ever sponsored by a soda brand, it would be disingenuous. I have even tried the poppy sodas that were all over social media because I was hashtag influenced. And I think they're just okay. They're not good. They're just meh. And like, why would I? Whatever. Moving on. So because influencers don't have this brand loyalty, I think they're susceptible to fall into traps of promoting things that either don't align with values in general. So like we've all heard about how the company BetterHelp has issues, like serious issues. And then I even heard recently in one of Shauna Rapari's videos about the financial companies that have sometimes been scams or gone under and people have lost money because financial influencers have recommended these to their followers. I'm not an expert on these matters, but I've just you know, anecdotally, hearing about the values of the companies that sponsor influencers and influencers not being an insider in that company, they're just the 
salesperson on the surface without even having a stake in the actual company. Like this just makes me uneasy about sponsored content of that nature. People can pay an influencer to say practically anything and on the surface it might seem okay. BetterHelp, for example, is a tool that sounds good in theory. Access to therapy for all, that's great. That's necessary and valuable. However, shady practices are not. Access to shady practices and information stealing is not valuable and is in fact harmful. And how is an influencer supposed to know that before the scandal arises? And then after a scandal arises, sure, they can do a Google search and refuse to be sponsored, but there will be somebody who accepts the sponsorship for the money and continues to spread this kind of misinformation or bad information. So I'm just a little bit sketched out on the possible ethics of sponsorships in that way because of the lack of connection between the influencers and the brands and the lack of value sharing and the lack of transparency, I think, between influencer and brand. And not only do influencers not have a connection to the brand that's offering the sponsorship, the benefits to them, they also have a disconnect from the customers. So salespeople, I was gonna say all the time, but I guess not these days, a lot of times salespeople will be working at a company or a retail store and have direct interaction with their customers. They will see the person, talk to the person, get a read on you know, what they can visually from the person and kind of build a natural rapport through talking and receiving interaction from them. Whether it's online, on the phone, if it's a one-to-one -one interaction or you know, one to not millions of people or thousands, hundreds of thousands of people, as long as the interaction levels are localized, I guess, the salesperson gets real feedback from the people they are selling to and can therefore have a community aspect of, oh, I actually am aware of your needs, care about your needs, know what your problems are, and value you enough to not take advantage of you. Bigger influencers can't have that. The volume of comments on their videos is too high. The demographic information gives them such a big picture view, right? You know, you get the ages and genders and locations of your viewers, perhaps, but you don't know what jobs they have. You don't know what their income level is. You don't know how they feel today. You don't know if they're suffering in the loneliness epidemic and vulnerable to buying things that you recommend just because they feel a connection to you and that's all they have in their lives right now. And that's not your fault as an influencer. That's not their fault. And again, tomorrow's video, my last installment, will kind of hammer that point home. It's not anybody's fault. I am not here to put the blame on anybody. I have even absolved myself a little bit of the blame because I was actually feeling pretty bad after my everything I was influenced to buy video. It was embarrassing for me to compile all the stuff and to film it and edit it, look back at it again, post it. And, you know, it's one of those moments of like, am I really doing this? What if people I know see this? Like, this is just, ugh. like, how would I explain this to somebody I know? But I think, again, it's not my fault entirely. Yes, I pressed the checkout button. Yes, I think I should be smarter than that. I don't want to admit that I fell for all the things that I fell for. But the truth is I was vulnerable emotionally when I made a lot of those purchases. I was lonely. I was going through a lot of changes and I did fall for a lot of the tactics, you know, being cooler, being in the in crowd, being able to buy a piece of the aspirational life that I wanted, being able to buy my way out of some of the hard times that I was experiencing or the adjustments, you know, if, even if it wasn't necessarily hard times. I actually do lead a very, very privileged life and I can acknowledge that. I have a roof over my head, a very nice roof, honestly a nicer home than I thought I would ever live in. I work in a job that I love and I'm only part-time. My husband actually works full-time and makes the majority of our family's income. I was able to have children that I wanted to have. I live somewhere that I don't hate to live. <laughs> so many things are good in my life and I'm not trying to say that, you know, I was suffering and therefore I bought things because I don't think I was really suffering. I was just in a place to be influenced, if that makes sense. So I was trawling online <laughs> as we do these days because scrolling social media has become an activity or a hobby, which problem number one. And my interest was able to be piqued by the products that I can buy. And like I said in another video this week, I think they come in all price ranges. So anybody can afford a piece of the pie, right? This. $10 things and $1,000 things. So pick your poison, right? And these things can manufacture as real things that you need. And again, another example that sticks out really strongly to me is the dental products. I saw that oil pulling advertised hard on TikTok. Seems like every other scroll was Guru Nanda 
oil pulling product. Here's my link in TikTok shop. My teeth are bad. I am gonna share a vlog of my apicoectomy procedure soon. And you'll see, like I had to get my gums cut open and a filling done at the root of my tooth because something's wrong up there. And I brush my teeth twice a day and floss. Dental health is an insecurity of mine and there's not a whole lot I could do about it, but it makes me susceptible to fall for that kind of product and marketing. And you know, everybody, has some kind of insecurity in their life, whether it's superficial or internal, there will always be a company that promises to address that insecurity if you buy what they're selling. It's like the David Foster Wallace quote that I shared in the video about choosing to monetize my channel. It did what all ads are supposed to do, create an anxiety relievable by purchase. There we go. So the ads that target my anxieties that already exist will really get me to buy. And then if ads are successful in creating anxieties in their viewers, there you go, you buy again. And again, I'm not saying that influencers are purposely trying to create anxieties in their viewers. I'm just saying that the nature of social media and seeing windows into so many people's lives, getting more <laughs> Joneses to keep up with, so to speak, you got so many Joneses now. So the possibility for an anxiety of your own life to start creeping in or develop based on seeing what the Joneses are doing. Millions of Joneses online, especially on short form content. If you're scrolling, you could see thousands of houses in a single day, thousands of bathrooms or bedrooms or outfits or makeup looks. And the false promises of what these products can do or the anxieties that they can alleviate even reach other vulnerable areas of the population. You know, for example, children. Okay, we can argue that children should not be allowed on these apps or should be supervised, but realistically speaking, anybody with a cell phone or access to a cell phone can be subjected to these kinds of marketing and ads that are not as overt as company produced advertisements. And again, like if you're a salesperson in a physical store and a child walks in, you're not gonna go up to them and try to sell stuff to them. You're not gonna, you know, especially if they're unattended, you're not gonna try to be pitching your products to the children of society, but you don't know who's watching your content if you're an influencer online. And so that separation again is kind of problematic in my opinion. And I guess the other problematic aspect of influencing in general is that it kind of makes a problematic behavior into a job. So it makes behavior like overconsuming shower scrubs into a job. You can justify having a wardrobe full of clothes and another room for a wardrobe because of your job. You can justify having a room full of perfumes or a wall full of Stanley cups because of your job. And that I think is damaging as well. I don't know that anybody should have justification for that level of overconsumption. And then I also don't know if they should be displaying that as something that's aspirational for other people to see. Other people, including vulnerable people in our population, as well as children. And that doesn't even cover the exploitation of vulnerable people and children in our population. But that's not part of this, this week's discussion. So I guess in conclusion, on the point of separation from your consumer, I almost think it's a predatory practice. And I want to emphasize once again that I don't think the influencer is a predatory person for doing the influencing. I just think that the setup is somewhat predatory in nature because you're separated from the company, you don't get the full story of what you're selling and you're separated from the person you're selling it to. So you don't get to evaluate whether you should be talking to this person or not in your sales pitch. Again, you get loose demographics of your audience. It's not your responsibility as an influencer to make sure that the minors are not watching or you know whatever it is. And you can, if it is really offensive to people, I actually don't know, are sponsored ads, do you have to mark those as for 18 and above on YouTube or TikTok? I don't, if somebody knows this, please tell me. And if you're an influencer out there, this is not to condemn you. Like, please don't feel like I'm telling you you're doing something bad. <laughs> this is all reflective. This is all my thoughts after not shopping for six months or trying not to shop for six months and removing myself from the cycle of seeing things, wanting things, buying things, and just thinking it's okay and not thinking about it. Now I'm thinking about it and these are the thoughts that are coming out that I'm sharing with you in the hopes that if you're struggling with consumerism in general, maybe it can help you to have some camaraderie on your own journey. I wonder if influencers would still do the job if they had to be labeled as professional over consumers or glorifiers of overconsumption or other titles that are, you know, make the job unattractive. What is the qualification to become a product influencer? Experience with products? My other question or issue or qualm with influencing as a job is if these people were not influencers, what would they or could they be doing 
to make their living and to contribute to society. Again, no shade to influencers for taking advantage of a lucrative and I don't want to say easy job, but like a job with many perks. A job that escapes many of the downsides of the jobs that are available in society. There are many influencers, successful influencers, that have pivoted from careers such as being doctors, pharmacists, nurses, teachers, and of course, you know, hospitality retail workers, and more. I don't know the full extent of every influencer who had a prior career. Some of these people gave up their prior careers entirely to do influencing full-time. So they're no longer contributing in the way that they used to to the society around them in the immediate community. They may be contributing to a huge community online, but again, the nature of those relationships is so different. The way they make their money now is so removed from both sides of the process. Is that why you make so much more money influencing if you're successful than you can as a nurse or a doctor or a teacher? Again, I'm no expert in business. Hell, I'm, I'm a musician, right? Like I know nothing, <laughs> next to nothing about successful marketing and business. I'm not saying that being a musician means that you don't. I'm just saying that I am in the more artistic community that values other things than money. And again, I'm not saying you have to be an artist to value other things over money. Like, I'm not trying to make sweeping generalizations. Let's just bring it back to me, right? I'm a musician. I'm not that business oriented. I'm not willing to take advantage of people if I feel like that's what's happening. Like, I will pull the plug on that if I feel like it's, you know, a whiff of that is in the air. Like, it makes me very uncomfortable. I prefer to interact directly or as directly as possible with the people that I make money from. And so therefore, you know, I'm a performer, I'm a teacher, people buy tickets to see a show that I'm a part of, and I'm present for all of that, or they pay to have a lesson in which I'm present for all of that. I don't know if it'd be the same if I made like an online course. I've never done that. And part of the, the reason that that makes me uncomfortable is that there's no opportunity for feedback. I guess you could have video submissions from your students and you could give them critiques and stuff. I did have to teach online during the year of 2020 when I did a year of high school orchestra directing and some of the students opted to stay home and learn online. And it was very difficult. I didn't get a lot of submissions of video homework, to be honest. So I had to provide a written option just to get anything sent in at all. Back to the matter at hand. So what else could that person be contributing to society instead of showcasing abnormally large collections of stuff in some cases or promoting more brands than one really needs to be aware of? in a lifetime. Kind of engaging in behavior that we used to call hoarding and used to view as a problem or as something to be dealt with and managed and fixed so that you can be free of your stuff and live a more normal life, but is now something that's kind of glorified and additionally something that makes people income. So if influencers didn't exist and people were never paid for these big collections, I think we would probably still see them as a problem. But also, perhaps more people would not have the big collections in the first place because they weren't making money off of it. You know, it's like that kind of loop system again, where it happens because they make money and then it contributes to a problem, but the problem continues because it's justifiable because they make money. But what I do know is that we don't see our homepages, our algorithm video recommendations, we don't tend to see them flooded with examples of reasonable consumption. We either see the examples of huge overconsumption or we see the complete zero waste minimalists. At least that's what I see anyway. I don't really see the people living their lives with normal amounts of stuff, partly because I guess the people that are not stuff focused YouTubers or TikTokers or social media influencers are focusing on something else, right? So like if they're not talking about stuff, they're talking about whatever it is that their niche is, like, you know, scrapbooking, music, medical stories, law stories, storytelling or crafting or creating something or performing. So their focus not being on their stuff, like we don't know what kind of amounts of stuff they have. They might be the ones with the reasonable collections, but we would never see it because that's not the focus of their channel. The channels that are focused on stuff will either show us abnormally large amounts of stuff, which then kind of make it okay for us to overconsume as well. Even if our level is not having a hundred lipsticks, now we might have 10 instead of five or 20 instead of 10. The scale is individual to each person. Or we see this side where they say, I'll, I only have five t-shirts. I only have one fork. I live a zero waste lifestyle where I don't produce any trash. You know, it's there's not a reasonable consumption channel that I know of without seeking it out on purpose. What is served to me is the extremes. While I've been interested in minimalism and zero waste living for a while, I just don't think I'm ever gonna get to the point of presenting the extreme of minimalism. 
I'm not going to be the person that has 10 shirts because I enjoy fashion and clothing. So while I might declutter down, declutter responsibly down to something that's not excessive, I don't think I'm ever going to reach the other extreme. So stay tuned. Maybe I'll be the reasonable consumption channel. <laughs> this is what a normal closet might look like. How boring. <laughs> How not shocking. Anyway, back to influencing as a job and I guess I can't not mention the feedback loop that I talked a little bit about yesterday where, you know, there are all the channels about how to make money, how to get rich quick. The ones that really stick out to me are like, make money drop shipping on Amazon. I made $600 last week just in my spare time through drop shipping. I made $2,000, you know, whatever, like teaching us how to work selling people stuff to our advantage. And not just any stuff, but stuff that's cheaply made, that nobody really needs, that feeds into huge companies like Amazon, Shein, Timu. Just... <sighs> and here we get the loop of overproduction because of the overselling. Like, that's the rest of the loop, I guess, that I didn't address yesterday, is that the loop of the consuming of the stuff is like these brands that produce trash, essentially, like trash that people market and pay for are producing them so that people can sell them so that people can produce them and then make you know there's people making money on every step of that journey and people losing money in the production like the people who actually do the work to make the goods are losing a quality of life not being paid a living wage in the country they're at not having the opportunity to have a more satisfying life and job problems that i'm not even really aware of the full extent of in this cycle of consumerism so bringing it back to the thesis is influencing a valid and ethical job? I don't know. I have a lot of questions and not a lot of answers, a lot of thoughts, and not a lot of expertise. But those were the thoughts of the day. <laughs> if they made you have thoughts, or if you have thoughts, or arguments, or gripes, or issues, or <laughs> complaints, or anything you would like to bring my attention to in the comments, I do bring my attention to the comments every time, so <laughs> feel free to do so. And if I have time, I'll sometimes write an essay in response because you all really do get me thinking. All right, I'm going to sign off there today. And I've got one more video this week to talk about whose fault all of this is. And again, to clarify that I don't blame anybody. And I will see you for that one tomorrow. Bye for now.